of all the things that have been most important to me, UNESCO and OECD and all of that, I began my life as a teacher. Well, not quite true. I began my life as a baby, actually. <laughs> but I began my professional life as a teacher, and I taught in schools. I taught French and German, unfortunately, not Catalan or Spanish, but I taught French and German in secondary schools and in primary schools for five or six years before going on to university. So my recollections and my feelings about teaching and learning come primarily from that experience of being a teacher. And yes, I'm going to, oh, I've got, no, I've got one of these, <laughs> one of these wonderful things that helps me to change the slides just like that. Um, the question I've asked teaching for learning, the future in the present, because I don't want to do was some wonderful stargazing about the future and what the future is going to look like and so on, because we always get it wrong anyway. Um, but to talk about the future in the present, to try and think about where we are now here and in different countries in terms of where we go from here, because ideally, as it was said, if I were you, somebody who asked for directions, if I were you, I wouldn't have started from here. Um, and of course we wouldn't. If we were designing a system for teaching and learning for children and young people, we wouldn't have started from here, would we? Uh, we would have started somewhere else. Um, so we are faced with what I've OECD calls the essential paradox that education is par excellence. It's a long-term investment, a long-term development. But we live in a world where we are dominated by short-term thinking and short-term decision-making. Now, this would be very true of most European countries, or perhaps most countries, that governments change every four or five years or so. And governments want to have their mark within those four or five years. And if you go to a country like Singapore, which is admittedly a dictatorship, nonetheless, they are in it for the long haul. And they think 10, 15, 20 years ahead. And when I was in Singapore in 1997, they were talking about planning 10, 15 years ahead because they know that change takes a long time and that we have to think long term rather than simply a government trying to decide within a few years that it's going to try and make its, make its reputation. We have to look at the beginning, I think, at some of the global, some of the important global f trends that are framing what's happening to the profession, what's happening to schools, and of course we have a developing a new economic landscape. We talk about knowledge-intensive service economies, that we are, that m the change is from manual labor, or the changes towards uh, businesses, towards organizations, that where knowledge is the currency. And we have seen in countries around the world, um, very marked in, in England, for example, very marked in the United States, very marked elsewhere, the widening divides between those who have the most and those who have the least, and new diversities. I was talking in London to a head teacher of a school in Hammersmith, um, which is one of the most deprived areas in London. And he said that he can't count on anything being the same from one week to the other because of the influx of Somali Somalian students coming in, students from Eastern Europe, and the population of the school is constantly on the move, constantly changing. Nothing you can take, take for granted. New diversities, 72 different languages spoken in that school. So these are the new conditions in which we're, we're living. And we are living with what's called transformative technologies. And the difference between the new technologies is that the users the young people, 
create the content. It's young people who are, who are the knowledge creators in this generation that we're, we're living in. Not always wonderful new knowledge, but often quite groundbreaking. I don't know if you read about this. I think he was an English student who's just been... He, he invented how t headlines for newspapers, how you could take newspapers and, and reduce them to, a, to, to get the essential content of the newspaper just in a paragraph. And Google paid him, I think it was, 15 million pounds. That's a school student, 15 million pounds, because he was creating a new way. Um, now, he's rather exceptional, you would say, but we are meeting young people in our schools who are well ahead of us as, as teachers, and we are learning from um, even them. My, I was in Paris yesterday with my granddaughter, who's four, and she was teaching me, no, Grandpa, this is how to do it. She's far better than I am at the age of four uh, with, with technology. Changing social connections and values. <coughs> Home life. If you read in the papers, what's the changing nature of the family? We talked about the family. The family now looks very different in many, many different countries. So the whole social fabric is changing. Now, if you've read Mark Twain and um, Tom Sawyer, Tom Sawyer says, what gets us into trouble is not what we don't know, it's what we're sure we know, but it just ain't so. And I think a lot of the time, we, particularly with our policymakers, I think they are very sure of what they know, but often it just ain't so. We have, I can say this quite openly, and I don't mind being reported on the fact, we have an absolutely Ander Neanderthal uh, Minister of uh, Education in England, Michael Gove. Um, yes, look it up. Um, when I say we, not in Scotland, where I come from, but in England, uh, Michael Gove thinks that all the things that he learned when he was at school, naming rivers on blank maps, naming mountains, Remembering dates, 1066 and all that, that's what children should be learning because that's what he learned when he was at school. And he is so out of touch with what's happening in the real world and what's happening in the world of schools and what's important to teachers. Um, the definition of insanity. Does anybody know the definition of insanity? Well, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> So when we change, if we're doing A and it's not working and we go to B and do something different and that's not working, we don't go back to A because that didn't work in the first place. We have to think and move on to C. We must constantly move on, not co constantly regress to that mythical golden age, of course, when children were wonderful and everything was great and parents were cooperative, and the world was a wonderful place. You remember that? I don't. Um, and we're faced with this phenomenon that's called lock-in. We are locked in into the expectations, expectations of government, expectations of parents. Well, parents, when I went to school, you know, that was fine, wasn't it? It was great when I was at school. We did all those things. So shouldn't school be the same as it was 20, 30 years ago? Nowadays, what are these teachers doing? Um, and the problem is that, that there's a very strong legacy of expectations of what a school should look like. A school should look like that famous old egg box school with its little compartments and everybody doing their own thing. Um, and we're, those expectations are very, very powerful. And of course, governments play into the expectations, particularly of parents or people who um, look back, to, you know, again, to the good old days. And I think one of our big tasks as an education system and as teachers is how do we bring parents with us? And the more we can bring parents in to understand the nature of changes and the nature of pedagogy, the more we're liable to get that
crucial partnership, the teacher-parent, or the triangle, as we call it, the pupil-parent-teacher. That is the key triangle that we know is what creates effective learning, and the more we can develop that relationship. And we're locked into structures, and I guess above all, um, we're locked into the globalization. Um, somewhere there's a pointer in this, but anyway, you can see it. We are locked into the global competition. And if I were to say currently, what's the country at the top of the league table currently? What would you say? Anybody? What country would we all look to as the best? Top of the, top of the league table. Spain? No. Mm, no. <laughs> Could be, but <laughs> should be. Which? You got it in one, <laughs> yes. Finland. Oh, yes. Finland is the top. It used to be Singapore. It used to be Taiwan. It used to be Hong Kong. Sorry? Korea. No, yes. Yes. Yes, Korea, North Korea, or South Korea, rather. <laughs> South Korea. <laughs> yes, it keeps changing, doesn't it, because of the global race. But um, the Finns don't speak to me anymore because I was at a conference and I questioned the, the myth of Finland, and they didn't like that. But, of course, there are a lot of things about the Finnish language. It's a very linguistic language, and it's a lot easier to get access to... Um, there's a lot of things about, it's a very homogeneous country. It doesn't have, like a lot of countries, 30, 40, 50 different ethnic groups. Um, in Finland, um, women had, could not get married unless they were able to read the Bible. So there's a high literacy rate, uh, historically among women. That's not to say that Finland doesn't do well, but there are a lot of factors that have to be taken into account. The United States does very badly, but if you take out certain ethnic groups, the United States does very well. So you have to approach that data very, with a considerable degree of skepticism as well. Um, the other thing, of course, is that Finnish teachers are paid extremely well. <laughs> it's one of the nice places to be if you're a teacher. Uh, so all of those things um, are a part of the, the globalization. Now, if we looked at the past and what we know uh, from research, this is from, o this is from Andreas Schleicher, who's now the deputy director in the OECD. He talks about the past, about some students learning at high levels, routine cognitive skills, taught to reach established content, hierarchical, Tayloristic, in other words, division of labor, hierarchies. Uh, responsibility primarily to authorities, and then talks about what we know of the most effective systems, and all students learn at high levels, learning to learn complex ways of thinking and working. High-level professional knowledge teachers as high-level knowledge workers, that's their trade, flat collegial, differentiated ca careers and accountability and evaluation to children themselves, to parents, but primarily teachers' accountability to teachers. Now, the whole... Uh, how does accountability translate into Catalan? What word do you use? Accountability. Uh, which? Yeah. The same. Rendicio de contas. It's, it's quite long. <laughs> oh, okay. That's the same concept. Whether it has the same meaning, I don't know. But politicians or others would see accountability as, as to the next level up. So you're accountable. If you're a teacher, you're accountable to the principal. If you're a principal, you're accountable to the commune. If you're commune, you're accountable to government. Well, we want to talk differently about accountability. We want to talk about lateral or reciprocal accountability. Who are you most accountable to? You're accountable to your colleagues, teachers to teachers. You're accountable to the children you teach, and you're accountable to the parents. Those come first in my book, that accountability is a downward or a lateral process, not an upward process, because if you get that right, if you get it right in terms of your accountability to your colleagues and so on, then you're much more likely to get the other bit right. 
but high-level professional knowledge workers. That's what teachers are in the best, um, in the best of systems. So what does that mean? Well, what good teachers do, seek out and create new knowledge. Teachers are knowledge creators. They're not just knowledge disseminators or knowledge passing on. Teachers are knowledge creators. And in this current climate, they are creating knowledge together with their, with their students, with their pupils. Um, again, you know, my four-year-old granddaughter, she's creating knowledge all the time. It's incredible. Um, she's asking questions. She's a philosopher. She's she loves logic, she's talking about it, she's asking questions. And I, can that stay, can that wonderful kind of enthusiasm and questioning about and creating new knowledge? So she creates and tells me new things that I didn't know before. Um, so we work with children and we work with our colleagues to create new knowledge. We learn from and with our students. We engage, and I think this third one is so critical, if we and I know it's more and more and more difficult to have that time to engage in learning conversations with our colleagues because there is so much pressure. But my advice to governments, and I sat on Tony Blair's task force for four years, create the space, create the space for teachers to have those learning conversations with their colleagues because that's how teachers learn. Who do teachers learn most from? You know the answer. <laughs> Who do teachers learn most from? Government? Um, their head teachers from their peers. We know that teachers learn from teachers. So you have to be able to create the space for teachers to have that opportunity to plan their lessons together. This is the thing I love about Hong Kong. They have built into the system collaborative teaching. Every teacher has to work at times with other teachers as collaborative lesson planning. They plan their lessons together, and then they teach the lesson, and they will observe one another teaching and give feedback. And say, they observe the four to one ratio, the four good things. I really like the way you engaged young people. I like the creativity. I like the way you use the technology. I like this. But I wonder if you could have had more opportunity for children to contribute, the four to one. Four good things, one criticism. Um, discussing and critiquing assessment of students' work. S teachers sitting around together looking at what children have done, their artwork, their writing, their musical performance, whatever. Discussing, and how would you rate that? You're a, you're a teacher of Spanish, you're a teacher of English, you're a teacher of mathematics. What would you say about that piece of work? And look, this child in this class does this wonderful work, but in your class doesn't seem to be. So, you know, how do we understand and the nature of children's work? Co-teaching. Do you co-teach? Do you ever teach alongside somebody else? So, most of my time recently, I, I like to co-teach with somebody else, because then you can stand back and you can evaluate, and then you're working together as a team. And that's tremendously important, if you can have the space to do it. And of course, what we call, uh, I suppose in Spanish, amigo critico, what would it be in <laughs> Catalan? A critical friend, um, someone who is first of all a friend, but also able to give you that kind of criticism, which is so valuable. But you come first as a friend, and second as a critic. Um, mm, mm, we've lost our arrows here, but you get the idea. Um, that there's a group which is called the Futures Thinking Group. It's a kind of, it's a Scottish group, of course, um, who have got together to think about the future. And they're very realistic because they start with the present, which is called Horizon One. The present is stability, predictability, fixed infrastructure. We have clear measures of success, exams, what you call, I think, evaluation, but we would call tests or exams, short-term evidence, tests, what they call crops rather than trees. Um, and horizon three, where we want to be, dynamic, exciting, 
A lot of uncertainty. We don't know what's happening, but that's good. Uncertainty, that's good. Flexible, creative spaces for teachers and young people. Emergent measures for success, not relying on the old measures that are tired and worn out. But how would we judge success of children's learning in this new world? We must have different new measures and long-term evidence, trees as opposed to crops. Um, but they say the, what they call the dilemma space in the middle, the dilemma space, is how do we get from horizon one to horizon three, the future and the present, that we have to work towards that vision where we want to be, but where we are now, how do we move across that, what they call that dilemma space. Well, in Cambridge, we have developed over, ever since I went there in the year 2000, that's 13 years ago, we started with um, a center which we called Leadership for Learning. Now, when we talk about leadership, we don't talk about the head teacher or the principal or the person at the apex of the organization. We talk about anybody who has a leadership role. We talk about teacher leadership. Teachers are leaders par excellence. Some young people, a lot of young people are leaders. So when we're talking about principles of leadership for learning, we're talking about distribuido or distributed leadership. But our five principles which have traveled to Ghana, these are now embedded in government policy in Ghana. And it's wonderful to see how they have moved with these principles. The first of which is a focus on learning. Seems obvious, doesn't it? That's what we're interested in as teachers. Learning at the heart of everything we do, that we come back constantly to the question of learning. And you can't really ask that question until you ask about the conditions for learning. What are the conditions that optimize learning? What about this here? This good conditions for learning? Are you happy <laughs> sitting there while I'm speaking? Is this, is, are these good conditions? Uh, did you say no? <laughs> uh, probably not. Um, I was in Rotterdam in the Netherlands, and it was the beginning of the year, and we went into this school, and this Dutch teacher, it was the first day of the year, and he said, what I do, he said, on the first day when the children come in, I just say, right, this is our, this is our, classroom. That's all I've got. This is the classroom. But I want you to spend this first period just exploring it. Is this a good place for learning? Pull out the drawers, open the cupboards, take the desks, rearrange, just play around with it and see if we can create a good environment for learning. So there immediately there's a sense kind of, of ownership of thinking about what makes, what makes good learning. We have somebody in England currently Sir Alan Steer, he's a sir. He's been made the government czar. Can you imagine? The government czar of learning. <laughs> because he had the most successful school in England. And I was researching it, and I wrote about it in the book, and you can read in the book what I thought of his school. Because he walked around, he was a huge big figure, you know, six foot ten or something, he would walk, what's that, in meters, about three, three and a half meters high. Um, he walked around the school and he said, how can children learn if they're not facing the front? Get all these desks facing the front. Um, how can children learn if they're not looking at the teacher? And they got very good results. And I reported this, I was writing, I was researching the school, and I spoke to a lot of students who said, we go back from university and we say, you know, you really did us a disservice. We never learned how to learn. We, you were, we were spoon-fed all the time and we passed our exams and we went to university and we found we were useless learners because you'd never helped us to take responsibility for our own learning. The conditions which optimize learning and creating a dialogue. Do you know the, the Greek dialogos, meaning flowing through it? and the word discussion, discutere, to tear to pieces. How often do we get a dialogue, meaning flowing through it about learning and leadership? And leadership we think of again as that heroic person 
at the apex of the organization rather than student leadership, teacher leadership. And one of my colleagues at Cambridge, David Frost, his whole life has been <coughs> devoted to teacher leadership. And he's working in a lot of Eastern European countries. And it's just been incredible when you take off the, op when you lift the opportunity for teachers to exercise leadership, how things can change. And as I've talked about, reciprocal <coughs> accountability. So there is the quote from Joe Murphy some time ago. Leadership is exercised not at the apex of the organizational pyramid, but at the center of the web of human relationships. At the center, this is where leadership works. It's a network of how we share. It's not an individual thing. Often it's a shared thing. I was at a, taking a group of us as teachers, taking children out to um, outdoor, outdoor pursuits and we had the principal and myself and a couple of other teachers and a boy fell into the river. Who exercised leadership? One of the teachers jumped in and saved him. Not the head teacher, <laughs> he was standing back, <laughs> didn't know what to do. Ex leadership is exercised at those moments by people who have no formal authority. I was in a staff room in an English school and I was watching people all having their tea and coffee and talking about things and there was a new teacher over here who was clearly distressed. She was, you could see, if you had eyes to see it, that she was very unhappy. Who got up, walked over and comforted that new teacher? Just one of her colleagues was perceptive enough to see and to actually go and support, support her. That's what teachers do. Well, OECD again, the global challenge creating a knowledge-rich profession in which schools and teachers have the authority to act, the necessary knowledge to do so wisely, and access to effective support systems. That's three, how many? Four years ago. Let me highlight a knowledge-rich profession and it's not just the knowledge about the subject that you teach, but it's a knowledge about the, it's knowledge about pedagogy, it's knowledge about learning, it's knowledge about in how organizations work. You have the authority to act as a teacher. Do you have the authority to act and access to effective support systems? Do you have access to people or systems that give you that support? to be able to not only do things well, but to, to change. And two researchers, this is some time ago, Berbalis and Densmore, 1991, say what is distinctive about the profession is a commitment to public service. Anybody notice a deliberate mistake? <laughs> A professional ethic sets teaching as a vocation apart from most other and less altruistic professions. Teaching is an altruistic profession. Although some people would like to make it a more selfish profession, it is by definition an altruistic profession. It puts other people's, particularly children's, interests first. And it is distinguished by its passion, by its positive emotional. It's a very, 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 emo I don't have to tell you, it's a very emotional job. Do you go home exhausted sometimes? <laughs> Do you need those holidays? Our government would like to cut down teachers' holidays, give them less time. Do you understand what it means to be a teacher and the emotional investment you make in that job? Hugely, hugely draining and emotional. So some questions about teachers as self-evaluators, um, asking the questions, inquiry. Do you engage in learning conversations with your colleagues or with your students? I was in a Cambridge school, primary school, these were children of nine, and I was sitting in this class for three hours, and the teacher had decided what they were going to do today was just to discuss learning, how they learned best, where they learned, how, and so on. And at the end of it, 
I just I said to her, this is incredible. These kids are so, so good, so astute. They ask such <coughs> penetrating questions about, they're so aware of their own learning. She said, ah, yes, but they didn't start like that. I've had this class for three years now. And it's taken me three years for them to be like that. And at one moment, they were talking about their, how do they learn best, who do they learn best with? And remember this little girl, she was only nine, she said to the teacher, you know what? She said, when you say, put your pencils down and listen to me, she said, you stop our learning. Here we are, we're learning away and we're discussing things, and you say, put our pencils down. And it stops our learning. How would the teacher respond to a, to a challenge like that? Well, there was a silence and she thought about it. She said, it's a good question, isn't it? She said, how will we reorganize this class so that we can take account of children's different pace of learning, their different ways, their different preferences? How are we going to do that? It's not my responsibility as a teacher, it's <laughs> our responsibility. So let's think about how we could make classroom a better place for our learning. What's the nature of staff room conversations? Are our meetings dominated by routine matters? Or do we really talk about how to improve a learning culture? Are we open to sharing problems? As a teacher, I, for four or five years, in my first job as a teacher, I never ever talked to anybody else about my teaching. I never, I had problems, I had discipline problems. I had read the book, Don't Smile Until <laughs> Christmas. <laughs> you start hard and then gradually you relax. I, had, I was too friendly, I didn't, it took me a year. Um, but I didn't share those problems. I was always nervous in case my head of department would walk in and he'd say, Mr. Macbeth, what's happening in this class? Uh, um, so sharing, talking about, talking about problems is not an easy job, is it? Um, mistakes they've made, great. Mistakes are great, aren't they? Because that's how you learn. And do you support your colleagues? So Judith Warren Little, the American writer, talking about teaching and learning, she says we must pursue the connections between those two things with aggressive curiosity and healthy skepticism. Our chief inspector in England, not ours, sorry, the chief inspector in England, the infamous Chris Woodhead, um, wrote a book in which he quoted me extensively as the man at the heart of the darkness in British education. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> I opened a newspaper, there was my picture, full picture, the man at the heart of the darkness in British education. <laughs> He had written a book called Class Wars, and in it, he has this wonderful phrase, teachers teach and children learn. It's as simple as that. And these stupid professors who go around <laughs> saying it's a very complex thing, I've got it wrong, because if you teach, children will learn. Simple. Chief Inspector of Schools, oh dear. Well, okay. <laughs> I looked up in the... Uh, I looked on the internet, this is some t time ago, and I looked up uh, teaching and learning. And I got these images from Google. Um, now, if you want to take 30 seconds or 45 seconds to talk to someone beside you or behind you or in front of you, just what would you say about teaching and learning if you had to use one word? Um, about the quality of teaching and learning. How would you, what would you say? <coughs> I'll give you 40, I'll be very generous and give you a minute, because I'm in a very generous mood. <laughs> Just have a, have a quick discussion among yourselves.
Okay, we're going to have to, because of my lousy Catalan, you're going to have to tell me in English. Um, give me a word. Any one word or phrase? Sharing. Sharing? Sharing, sorry? Enjoying. Enjoying. Terrible, isn't it? Heresy. <laughs> Enjoying. <laughs> Come Learning is enjoyable. Sharing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Enjoying. Environment. Environment. Yes. It'd be difficult to fish if you didn't have a river, wouldn't it? <laughs> It'd be difficult to swim <laughs> if you didn't have water. Difficult to ride a bike if, <laughs> if you didn't have a bicycle. Environment, yes. Nice Sorry? Company. Company. Yes. It is. It's very collegial, isn't it? Very nice company. Lifelong. Yes, look, we've got some very old people in here, <laughs> but they're still learning, obviously. Yes. Yeah, playing. All people, same to do. Yeah, something. Okay. Yes, active. It's very active, isn't it? You're actually doing something. Yeah. yeah. What was it you were saying, sorry? Hands-on, same, yeah, similar thing. Hands-on, isn't it, we would say. Active, it's active. Learning is active. Hmm. And it's, we would say, collegial or reciprocal, isn't it? That people are learning together. There's a kind of a companionship, yeah. Um, well, here, as we say in the cooking programs, here's one I cooked earlier. <laughs> <laughs> These aren't all the right answers, but they're more or less things you've said, embedded in relationships, contextualized, in other words, it's the context, the environment. It's very learner-centered, all of them, aren't they? They're, they're all learner. They're all learner-centered, all of them. Concerned with skills and dispositions, meaning attitudes, supportive, Supportive, but challenging. Oh, it looks a bit, oh, not sure. This guy here about to jump into the pool, he's not too sure about that. The kid on the bike, oh, a little risky, yeah. Um, but a lot of, look at the sort of hands-on, the f teachers. I mean, we've got a terrible thing in, in England that teachers aren't allowed to touch children. And for all sorts of reasons, but when you watch teachers who, that physical contact that they have, children who are upset or, and teachers are hugging them and um, the physical contact is so important. Um, enjoyable but risky and we know relaxed but alert that the best, best learning occurs when, when children or adults, whatever, are most relaxed but they're also alert. And, as you said, lifelong or age-blind. I've called it teaching and learning in the wild, not in captivity. Teaching and learning in captivity and teaching and learning in the wild. So when we captive these children, we bring them in. I'm waiting to see what happens to my four-year-old granddaughter as she beginning, she's beginning to understand about learning in captivity. Um, but as Carol Dweck, again, an American, talks about, to be truly skillful outside of school, people must develop situation-specific forms of confidence. That is, things that are specific to the context in which they're working. And she says in school, learning is generalizable, creating a situation whereby very little can be transported directly from school <coughs> to out-of-school use. Mm. Very little from school to out of school use. So if you are to ask me, what did you learn in school, John Macbeth, that you now use <laughs> in your daily life? Mm. Mm. Not a lot. Um, and the OECD, which tests people in industrialized country, not checking what will, simply what students have learned or what they were recently taught, but what extent students can extrapolate, can take further what they've learned and apply their knowledge and their skills in novel settings. 
Now, my very favorite educator of all time, David Perkins at Harvard, he did an experiment with children to find out if they, in a, what he called an open field, if they could take their knowledge and apply it in an open field when they had no, they didn't have any of the props that the teacher was there or the, the book or anything else. And children who could achieve 100% in a classroom test scored zero <laughs> when they didn't have all those things around them. Now, good teaching would say, if you had very good teachers, those teachers would have helped young people to take the learning how to learn from the classroom into other contexts. In, I don't know if this is true in Spain, but in England we found that children in mathematics cross the corridor into another classroom in science, and the science teacher says, now that's what you learned in mathematics. And the kids go, mm. but this is science. <laughs> yes, but can you apply what you learned in mathematics in a science classroom? And they're not very good even at taking their learning from one situation to another. Now, I'm sure that doesn't happen here. Um, so, <laughs> David Perkins, next time you want a wonderful speaker, ask, or any of his books, The Mind's Best Work. He's written some wonderful books, very accessible, and we've done a lot of work together with him, and we've used many of his routines. And here's simple routines. That's the thing that makes them really good. Connect, extend, challenge. So you could re reply that right now. What does, what I'm talking about, what does it connect with in your experience? Am I making any connections? Hopefully. Am I making connections? Am I extending your thinking at all? I hope so. <laughs> Am I challenging your thinking? I hope so. And that's what good teachers would do. They would connect extend and challenge thinking. It's just a wonderful, simple little trilogy there. The other thing, what makes you say that? I've, I've watched David Perkins working with the class and children giving answers. No hands up, the no hands up rule. Let's think about it. What makes you say that? And then you discover some of the theories. Two and two plus, this is in a class, two and two equals five. What makes you say that? Is that the correct answer? It's the correct answer to a different question. So what's the child thinking about two and two equals five? So what makes you say that? What do you think you know? But it just ain't so. What puzzles you? What do you think about? Um, here's one student in my class. This is what puzzles me. You fly from Glasgow, where I live, in Scotland, in the north of Scotland, fly from Glasgow to Boston in the United States. How long does that take in the plane? Um, five hours. Hmm, what's the time difference between Glasgow and Boston? Five hours. Ooh. So why doesn't the plane just go up and wait for Boston to come round? Hmm. Answer? <laughs> You're a professor, aren't you? <laughs> Answers on a postcard, please, afterwards. But those kind of... What are the big questions that... Um, why do kamikaze pilots wear helmets? Hmm. <laughs> yes, you're talking about... <laughs> the speed of... Yes, you're talking about the speed of light. What's the speed of dark? Hmm. <laughs> what do you wonder about? And this routine, which has become quite common now in a lot of classrooms, think, pair, share. So I'm going to ask a question. I want you to think about it, and then I want you to pair with somebody else, and then I want you to share. I'm not going to do that at the moment, maybe in a minute, but think, pair, share. So you know in a classroom the teachers ask a question. Everybody, hands up, hands up, hands up, hands up. Um, no, hands down. Think, pair, share, and then we'll take different answers. <coughs> In a mathematics class, how many different answers, different ways are there that children try to solve a problem? 
and I used to think, but now I think. Um, well, um, this will give me a chance to have a drink of water in a minute. <coughs> Five W's plus H. I tried to translate these into Catalan, but failed miserably. Think about this for a minute or two while I have a drink of water. Um, which would, if you were to say what's the most important in children's learning, what matters most, is it the what of their learning? Is it the where? Is it the when? Is it the who or the who with that they're learning? Is it the why? And is it the how of their learning? So again, just think pair share for just a minute or so. See, I timed my cough just for that. Okay. That was that was good, wasn't it? <laughs> I've totally lost track of time here. Should I? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Ten. Ten to fifteen. Okay. Okay, what would you say is the most important? The how? The how of learning. The why? The how and the why? Any other votes? Well, here's one I cooked earlier, but it may be not... Um, you might not agree, that doesn't matter, but um, there is some, quite a lot of research to say that who you learn with, the peer effect, who you learn with is pretty, pretty important. Um, it's called the compositional effect, which has been well researched in a number of countries. But the how, how you learn clearly, you would say, is the thing that you carry away from school at the end, isn't it? the ability to learn, learning how to learn, and the why. Um, I, got a, I got into big trouble with this inspector, who I've just quoted Chris Woodhead, because I quoted a child saying, why are you teaching me this today? <laughs> why are you teaching me this? And he said, this is ridiculous. A child should never ask a question like that. Um, why are you learning? And the where. We know that where, if you think about children's homework. Where do they do their homework? Do they do it on the phone to their friends? Do they do it in front of the television? Do they do it listening to loud music? Where? We did a lot of research. We sat beside children in their homes doing homework and they told us about how it was very helpful to have loud music sometimes because it blotted out all the other things and you could concentrate on your work. Um, how many of you actually have music when you're studying? Mm -hmm. And you find that helpful. So the where and the when. And the when, do, we, do you wake up at three in the morning and think, oh, great idea. Or at three in the afternoon. We know that three in the afternoon is the lowest point in people. That's when the energy is at the lowest. And it's actually at its highest at three o'clock in the morning. Uh, that's a generalization, of course. But the what, I've put it at the bottom because the what, in a way, is the thing that stays with you least, it's the thing that disappears most, particularly when you get to an advanced age like myself, the what is very frighteningly disappearing. This is a school in England where this poster was up on the corridors and it was in the, the toilets and it was in everywhere you went in the school. And the head teacher, he would walk around the school and he'd stop children and say, what did you learn in school today? Well. In maths, we did the, mon the median, the mode, and the mean. That's what we did today in maths. He said, no, I didn't ask you what you were taught. I asked you what you learned. And he constantly probing, what did you learn? What did you learn in school today? And 
I'll do very quickly the five W's plus H, but the what, we measure attainment and tactical learning which appear above the surface. This is, by the way, my, my attempt at an olive tree when I was in Athens and I saw the olive trees and they said, you know, in the hot weather, the olive tree just burns away, but it's got very, very deep roots which go down four kilometers into the ground. So I thought, well, that's a good metaphor for understanding, which lies often below the level. Or metacognition, thinking about your thinking, or the skills and strategies that you take with you from one context to another. The what? The peer effect, yes. Your father says he'll stop wearing his trousers like that when you do. We saw a bit of this actually outside while we were waiting to come in, didn't we? I was, um, we were marvelling at some of these guys showing, the, showing their anatomy. Uh, yes. A bit bizarre. The how, here's a simple thing, the Open University in the United Kingdom talking about, just take a time out in any lesson, what are they doing? Description of what they're doing. How are they learning, do you think? What, as a teacher, am I learning? And what will I do next? So that just stepping back and allowing time for reflection and thinking about the how. And Ken Robinson, who, I don't know if he came here and talked, but we were talking about him earlier. He's saying that if you're not prepared to be wrong, you'll never come up with anything original. But by the time they get to adults, most kids have lost that capacity. They become frightened of being wrong. I certainly was when I was at school. In fact, we used to get the belt in Scotland when you made a mistake. Out, in, sit down again. Mistakes were punished. Mistakes are the worst thing you can make. Whereas, he was a teacher, had us on his wall. A young teacher, he was a wonderful guy his ponytail and his jeans, and he was a real hip teacher. <laughs> and he had that. The kids loved him. And he, if at first you fail, try again, fail better. And he brought in the guy who'd invented the Dyson vacuum machine. And the kids asked him, how many attempts did you have? And he said, 225 times. 225 failures? No, 225 learning opportunities. Mistakes are great. Let's encourage mistakes. Well, I was going to ask you a quiz question, but I'll give you the answer instead of asking you. Here is a piece of work done by Baroness Susan Greenfield at The Other Place. If you're at Cambridge, you talk about The Other Place. You never mention it by name. <laughs> and if you're at Oxford, <laughs> you talk about The Other Place. Um, Hours in school, hours at home, hours in the virtual world. Now, our sometimes our ministers of education in the UK think that we can do it all in the 900 hours. So they put pressure on teachers. Why, why are these children not learning? Why are they not um, learning as, in terms of all the things we've done for you as a government? Because... It's a minority of time that children spend in the classroom compared with where they spend outside. But how do we, as good teachers, make those connections between the virtual world, the hours at home, and the hours in school? How do we build on that kind of those connections and learning? I love this. Dear Andy, how have you been? Your mother and I are fine. We miss you. Please sign off your computer and come downstairs for, <laughs> for something to eat. Love, Dad. <laughs> Upstairs in the virtual world. And we talk about in, in um, construction, um, constructivist theorists talk about how learning is constructed. And if we think about sites in which learning is constructed, how do we organize, how do we attempt to
to get together those different contexts of the neighborhood, the school, the parents, the media, the classroom, the extracurricular activities. This is the challenge that schools and teachers are facing. How do you begin to make those connections? And I just want to say a little about, to finish off five minutes or so, if I may, with um, talking about the Children's University in, in the UK. Um, Graham Greene, the moment in childhood, then the door opens and lets the future in. And the Children's University is now, um, for children between the ages of 5 and 14, and at the moment in the UK, there are 1,500 learning destinations. That is, places outside of school where children can go to learn. 2,700 schools in England are, it's now more than that, are involved with the Children's University. And what they do is they sign up to be part of this big network and they identify, there's a map, you can go on the website, just put in Children's University and you'll see the map and you can, it's an interactive map and shows you the whole of the UK with the thousands of places that children can go. Um, and if you think of Barcelona as a city which offers a rich, incredibly rich environment, isn't it, for learning, all these organizations, agencies, institutions, places, just walk down La Ramblas and you go and <laughs> learn a lot. Um, and learning destinations, airports. What can you learn in an airport? Time. Learn an awful time. time. <laughs> but look at that destination board. God, where are they going? Where are all these places? Where are they? I don't know these places even exist. How long does it take to get there? A cemetery. What can you learn in a cemetery? This is one of the learning destinations that's been validated. Um, about what did, you know, what was longevity like? How long did people live in these days? And what were families like? And I wonder why, what kind of diseases and so on. So the learning destinations get validated. Somebody comes along and says, if you offer a structured learning opportunity, you get validated. So the House of Commons has got a logo on it saying Children's University validated learning destination because children can go to the House of Commons and they can learn something about government. Um, and museums, this is the Strozzi Museum in Firenze, which is a Children's University learning destination because they have destinations now in Europe and a lot of places and in Malaysia, in China, in Australia, in Hong Kong, in, in Shanghai, in Beijing. It's becoming a worldwide movement. And children who sign up and take part, they're issued with a passport, a passport to learning. And when it was issued, the children said, no, this isn't like a real passport, because real passports have got rounded edges, not square edges. So they reissued the passport now with rounded edges. And for each experience they have of 15, when they've got Sorry, when they've got 30 hours of validated stamps on their passport, they can go and they can graduate at a university with the vice chancellor and their mummies and their daddies all come. And fathers, all dressed up in their suits and their ties, who have never darkened the door of a school, come to the graduation. Now, I'm evaluating this over the course of, this is my fourth year as an evaluator. And the key things, children attend school much better because they get, if they don't attend school, they can't participate. So they come to school even when they're not feeling very well. Their achievement has risen considerably and their attitudes to learning and to school have changed quite, quite dramatically. Um, so it's a very small example. But as one of the things we do know when we talk about change and how it occurs, of which the Children's University would be an example, in every country around the world, the innovators, these are, that's you, here you are, the people who are the innovators, and then the early adopters, the people that you gradually bring on, then the early majority, and then eventually the late majority. But it takes time over uh, a period of time before that, um, that change actually occurs. But it's teachers leading the process of change. 
so three things. The rule of the vital few. A few exceptional people doing something different start and incubate an academic. That's how change works. A few people can start an epidemic. A few teachers. We've seen it again and again in our research that we've done. A few a collection. You won't do it individually, but a few teachers together doing something different. And you need the stickiness factor, because epidemics don't work unless they catch and become contagious. So there has to be a stickiness because you have evidence that it works. And of course, the power of context, because academics won't, don't work unless there is a context which is helpful enough. So what are you going to start doing that you haven't done before? That means you're going to have to stop doing some things and you have to go on doing some things. But if you took that and you thought, as a group in our school, what could we now stop doing that we've been doing for so long? What really is so important that we're going to go on doing it? And what are the kind of things we haven't really done before, but we could start doing? So it, that is an equation. And I talk about flying below the radar. When we do that, the teachers who are going to change, or school leaders who are going to change their schools, know how to fly below the radar, pushing at the boundaries of what is mandated and what is within teachers' own compass and professional reach, what is within your compass to actually change and make a difference. That strong sense of internal accountability. I'm very aware in any of these discussions that you have to be very... <laughs> there are no simple answers here because if I come to your country and tell you how to do things, because you're working in a context which you know far better than I do, and you know where the space is or the, the leverage is, if you like, for change. Um, but I think over a long period of time, I think the most successful example I would have is where in Hong Kong, where I, it's been a long time working together with teachers, but encouraging, finding examples of collective work among teachers that you can say to governments, look, this is what teachers have achieved. Open your eyes and see the quality of the work. And if I go out now and speak to teachers in Hong Kong, they'd say, no, let's have somebody, let's have other teachers, because there's lots of lots of things where they take teachers out of schools and they have these um, big workshops for teachers, and I've run lots and lots of them. But ultimately, teachers learn best, they tell us, from learning when, you, when they have opportunities to learn from their colleagues. So a lot of research is telling us, not just in Hong Kong, but elsewhere, if you create opportunities and structures for teachers to get together and share practice, that is actually a lot more effective way than taking teachers out of their schools to come and listen to gurus from Cambridge or wherever else. So we can kind of inject some ideas here, but the way the change is going to occur with teachers working together, sharing practice, and thinking about how you create those different kinds of spaces in, in the school. My daughter is actually a, a school principal. She's a head teacher in a school in Scotland. And she will sit down with the whole staff and they will spend time thinking, how could we, how could we, as a group of staff here, create the space to do things so that we don't necessarily, you know, the old aphorism, teach teach less, learn more? Could we reduce the amount of time we teach? And children might actually learn more if we invested more time as teachers in sharing our practice. Now, I think one of the big fallacies of governments, and we've seen it around the world, they think that if you ask teachers to teach more, more time, more time teaching, that children will learn more. There is no evidence to support that. There is a lot of evidence to support teach less and children will learn more. But I think that governments don't understand that. So part, you know, you were talking about trade unions. Isn't that part of what trade unions <laughs> are about? 
trying to... I mean, I think one of the dangers of trade unionism, because I've worked with the National Union of Teachers now for 20 years, but trying to convince them that it's not about confrontation and it's not about anything that government suggests, we'll throw it out, but how do you, how do you have a more proactive showing, suggesting to governments things, how they may be able to, to change. And I think uh, that the NUT, the National Union of Teachers, has actually been very good in some respects of helping to change government thinking, particularly about school self-evaluation. Um, it's not just Finland. I think when we look at the OECD data and you disaggregate by ethnic group, by immigration, by all sorts of other things, you get a very different picture. So again, the United States is classic in this, that it doesn't perform well in, in tests. But then you have to look at a huge volatile population, particularly, say, on the Mexican border, where you've got a lot of people coming in and they don't speak, their first language isn't English, and so on. So you have to, in any country that has a very complex ethnic mix, you have to be very careful about how you are making conclusions, as in Finland. So, I mean, Hong Kong would be similar. They do very well. Singapore does extremely well. It's the countries that have got a more homogeneous population. So it's, it's a measure. It's a measure that is not sophisticated enough to tell us. Um, I mean, one of the measures is the difference between the highest and the lowest achieving. Where is the biggest gap? Do you know which country in the world has got the biggest gap between the highest and lowest is New Zealand? And it's between the Maori and the Pacifica populations as against the indigenous population. And it's because the system hasn't addressed that kind of disparity. Although, in some respects, as I said earlier, New Zealand is regarded by the OECD as the most advanced country. But, but... <laughs> You still have that big disparity. About hierarchy is a really, this is a really tough question about should you have a different kind of qualifications of teachers so that you've got master teachers, you've got, um, you've got heads of units and you've got uh, paraprofessionals and so on. This, if you take the UK as an example of the danger of this, because of a teacher shortage and because of a whole lot of political things in, the, in England, there are a lot of people who have come in as teaching assistants who have no qualifications whatsoever. They're very nice, kind, they're parents often, and they come in and they help out and they help out teachers in the classroom. But because of teacher shortage or teacher absenteeism, they take over the class. <laughs> So you've got untrained people, unqualified people in schools who are teaching. And naturally, the union is opposing this, and why wouldn't they? Of course they should, because it does, it's a disservice to the children to have people who aren't, who aren't qualified as teachers. And it's the thin end of a wedge. As soon as you begin, and it's growing. I mean, we wrote a report a few years ago. My colleague, Morris Galton, and myself, we investigated, wrote a report about this, which was frankly a scandal and it's not getting any better it's actually getting it's getting worse so i think you've always got to keep an eye on that notion of um the paraprofessionals if you like great to have them but you have to circum you have to put boundaries around what they're allowed to do and for them to teach classes is simply just not acceptable um but we also i mean when I was on the government task force, the Tony Blair task force, we had a number of people from industry, we had people from all over, we had people who came in as external experts like Ben Levin from Canada. And they were talking, they wanted to introduce performance pay. Teachers paid differentially on a basis of performance. And good old Ben Levin from Canada, who was a minister in Canada, and a leading researcher in the world. So we have no evidence anywhere in the world, no evidence that differential pay actually benefits schools or teachers. And I was in New York a year ago at the 
in the summit conference where they brought together ministers from 52 countries, I think, and had three days. And there were five countries that said we're about to introduce performance pay. And a few of the experts there said, well, think again. Think again, because it can be very divisive, and it probably doesn't actually, there's no evidence that it helps. And some of those countries, to their credit, like Malaysia, uh, went back and said, no, we're going, we will rethink that because of the evidence. And then thirdly, schools cannot do it all. Schools cannot do it all. That is the title, I think, of, of a book. And I think it's a very, uh, very pernicious, a very disempowering thing for governments to put all that pressure on teachers to say that you can repair the ruins of a childhood. I was working in Canada when we had children from the... You would, they call the First Nation people, you might call them Eskimos, or, but First Nation people, people living right up in the Arctic Circle. And as you can imagine, there's not a lot to do in the winter or any other time, and there's a heavy, heavy drink problem, a lot of alcoholism. And children, before they are born, they've already got fetal alcohol syndrome. So these kids are already damaged and they're coming to schools and government saying, you can do it all if you're just a good enough teacher, you, you know, raise attainment. But they have already lost so much of their capacity to learn uh, because of the environment. One of the, one of the developments that I've been involved in in Scotland particularly is what's uh, called um, multidisciplinary work. And the best example I can think of currently in the school I mentioned, Phoenix School in Hammersmith and Fulham, they have very, very good, they have health workers, they have social workers, they have psychologists, they have community workers, they have uh, local parents, they have people from industry, they, they bring in, they have built networks with a whole range of people who know how to support children or work with children in different contexts. And that's been, that has been absolutely crucial to that school that teachers didn't have to deal with the fact that 70% of children in the classroom had special educational needs, that 80% of children were on free school meals, that 90% of children in some classrooms had no English as a first language. What's the teacher supposed to do? You know, what an incredible burden that is on teachers unless you bring in support services like that. And they're not, you know, in terms of what we said earlier, they're not taking over the teaching, but they're supporting the teacher and working collaboratively. You've heard of full service schools? Quite a lot written in the United States about full service. Um, schools that don't just see themselves as little islands in the community, but have very strong networks with the community. But the hole in the wall was in communities where children didn't go to school at all. They put a, um, a computer in the wall and then they watched with a, a camera what children would do. And children were teaching one another and learning together. and. Then uh, the notion was, well, we don't need school at all, do we? Because these children are doing just as well. But the outcome of it was that school became even more important in a lot of ways, but it did change the role of the teacher. And the teacher became somebody who was, who was less of a deliverer, but somebody who was more of a helping children to collaborate in different ways in their learning, drawing on the capital, the social capital of children. Now, it reminded me when you were speaking of the Khan Academy in the United States, and K-H-A-N, again, you can look it up, but there are hundreds, if not thousands, now of schools in the United States involved in the Khan Academy. And what they've done is they've reversed the notion of teach in school, children do homework. What they do at home, children do the learning at home, and at school, they do their homework. <laughs> uh, They've created ten short 10-minute videos of teaching all the basic concepts so, and going right the way up through the different layers. Children study these at home, 
And when they come into school, they, they work in groups and they network and they talk about their learning. And the teacher becomes more of a facilitator, working with children in different groups and helping, you know, some will have not done it or not understood it. But the thing about the, the video tapes is they can stop, they can replay, they can stop, don't understand that, replay it again and so on. So it does alter the, the relationship and gives teachers a different kind of role in the classroom. But I think your point that all of these things just accentuate and emphasize the value of teachers, that those who think that we're going to get rid of teachers in this brave new world, the role of teachers is certainly, certainly changing, but they are become, become more and more and more important because the church, less and less people involved in the church, less people in nuclear families, less opportunities for children, so school becomes the place. Teachers become the one group that is has got that moral base, if you like, that set of values and that understanding of the nature of children and the nature of learning.